Welcome to a new test and teardown video. This time it's a spectrum analyzer. It's a TS-148UP. It is from American military, specially made for radar stations. So this one could test uh, uplinks and downlink uh, for radar, radar systems. And it covers the X-band. This is uh, 8.4 to 9.6 gigahertz. So it's a very, very fast spectrum analyzer. The main design is from 1945. And uh, I think this one is uh, 1950. Uh, this one went through quite a lot of modifications. I'm going to show you those in a minute. About this Spectrum Analyzer, it is already packed out, so we can see what's inside here, so that's nice and easy. You see there's a little modification here with the mains plug that has been changed with a cable, so that's easier. There's a waveguide here, and this is, uh, of course, for normal, this is very normal for radar systems, and especially for 8, 9 gigahertz. So that is definitely how it's done. It is a very, very simple, this design. Not that many tubes. So if you look here, there's uh, not quite a lot. It's also those two uh, rectifier tubes. Um, they have been replaced with diodes. Let me get some light here so we can see what we're doing. And also the transformer is not the original because the original transformer was a 115 volts only. So that is why this one was changed. It looks like this one is from an old oscilloscope or something like that. See, there's even a little funny mechanical solution here. And there's a, a diode and a resistor here for the high voltage um, for the oscillator tube. There's normally a little shielded case here around this oscillator tube I actually wanted just to power it up and see how much is uh, working just to see <laughs> it's gonna blow up or whatever it is the guy that just gave me this one uh, said it actually worked 10 years ago when he uh, tested it and then put it for storage so, hey, let's just power it up and see if it still works 10 years later. <laughs> I drove like 300 kilometers to get this thing, so I really hope it works. Let's uh, let's look at all the funny modifications here. See, when you can't get the original tube anymore, then you can always solder in some other sockets, adapters, and other tubes like that. Isn't that just cool? Yeah, I've been through all the tubes here and they seem like they're all more or less okay in the sockets. And also I checked for no white markings or any other stuff like that. And all this, all the neon regulator tubes, they're also nice and intact. So, I think I'm ready to power it up. I am now ready for the first power up. And uh, yeah, I got an extra wire on the chassis for earth protection because I really don't want to kill myself. And here we go. Turn on mains and 100 watts, 80 watts, 70 watts. 66 okay so that is good i think intensity is here right so let me crank oh we got some nice light here so let me turn off the light oh look at that look at that we got sweep <laughs> so that will be the mixer focus is also working spectrum middle 92 watts Frequency sweep. Oh, now the now the picture is is gone. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I. Where the heck? Heck is it? Yeah. You see something? I don't know what I'm doing here. This has nothing to do with with the radar, as far as I know, right? Intensity is maximum. Hmm. Okay, so that is the mixer. Okay, I need to play a little bit more. I always get super scared when I get products like this. See? This is how you open and close it. And I only had one screw here and one screw here in the other one. So, yeah, that means there's most likely some little thingy here that is not working. And uh, I've been looking a little bit here. And the thing that I see, that's most likely some filter capacitors for some high voltage and goody goody stuff, right? One has another color than the other one, and this resistor is burnt. So that can't be good. That is our mains input, right? And we've got some capacitors here. So this mains input goes to... What is that? Going somewhere, right? It's just some other capacitors. Scary stuff here, right? Hmm. So where is it? I have actually already been looking with my thermal camera and I didn't find anything. But I see the power consumption is just rising and rising all the time. So there's definitely something wrong here. But where is it? Well, actually, a lot of capacitors here. Look at all those. It's it's actually all capacitors here and here and here, right? All this, all this. No, that's an inductor, right? Yeah, I think I actually found more or less a schematic, so I should be able to uh, to pinpoint uh, some um, good measuring points. Here is the manual that I found. Look at those two pots here. It says plus 300 adjustment and then spot adjustment. And look at that. So the 300 should be in the very corner. Okay, here's the CRT at the very corner. So let's look at my unit. The very corner says spot adjustment and then plus 300. So that means uh, my unit is not matching my manual. And it actually also looks like somebody's been writing 200 and something, whatever that is, up there, right? And, of course, uh, the 300 is not 300 at all. It is very low. So, what is going on here? I'm still poking around with this damn unit. Looking here with my thermal. I got some resistors here that's 120 Celsius. That can't be good. So I think that is what's causing the funny, funny smell. And now, see, the power consumption is 93. But it's rising and it just continues to rise until 120. And then I kind of turn it off. So what the heck is going on here? Why is it rising and rising? If I just leave it as it is right here. That can't be good. That must be a sign. Okay, you gotta see this. What is that? That is a pod meter. God damn it, that pod meter is red glowing inside. What the heck is going on inside that pod meter? Whoo, I found something funny, funny. So that is the intensity pod meter it says 25 kilo ohms let me see if i can figure out the colors so we got 
a white in the middle white with a orange stripe and then the orange with orange with no yellow with black stripe and then this resistor all right goody goody i got it let me try right and uh i got actually got an idea maybe i should just desolder those wires and put in um an external pot meter and see if i can carry on from here still could be interesting to see what is going on because that pot meter is just red glowing hot wild <sighs> so while we are in the progress to reboot all systems and get live up and online again <laughs> this damn thing did of course leak to chassis and uh, via mains as well so this is my little life protector this cable here goes to my earth and this is why my hpfi relay can actually shut off and save my life and while i'm playing around with this voltage so this pot meter is of course not to blame for the problem but current consumption leak in some of the capacitors um, this intensity uh, pot meter uh, well all all high voltage actually goes through this pot meter and then continues to the focus system and to other systems right so there's this 100k resistor down here let me turn on the the light and that one doesn't really get warm so i think i am actually very close to figuring this out because if i look at the schematic there's not a lot more to blame than one or two capacitors it can be but i can uh, i can see that we got about 500 volts over this pot meter when this happens so obviously it's going to get warm right <laughs> no big surprise here but now i need to figure out what capacitor it can be uh, because I can't really turn this on again and do some more experiments because it's going to click my HPFI. Darn it. Let's look at the power supply schematic. And um, see here with the red arrow. Here I have marked R163. That is the intensity pot meter. That gets very, very warm. I uh, measured... The output side of it, uh, the one that goes to cathode, cathode pin 2 of the CRT, and that one goes really, really low. And uh, we already figured out that R164 is not getting extremely hot. So uh, that means all the focus and the rest of the stuff to the right, it can't be that that's causing the problem. So what else is connected to pin 3? or two or five of the CRT. Okay, so let's swap to the page with the CRT. Here we see the intensity, um, the cathode voltage that goes to pin two, and then we see the focus voltage. So there here is actually a capacitor between intensity and, and cathode and focus and cathode. And uh, that can't be it, right? Because that, that capacitor is not going to ground. That that um, capacitor will, if that is leaky, if that is shorted, that will only cause um, less problems, actually, right? That, that means we'll just uh, pull current, you know, outside of that um, resistor, I assume. <laughs> so even if they're completely shorted, right? So that's not going to heat up this capacitor. So let's go back to the power supply schematic again. I think it is C130. Uh, we should try and uh, change and then see if it is any better. But how is that actually causing my HPFI to fail? Maybe I got a multiple uh, problem, one of the capacitors uh, from the primary side to chassis uh, is probably uh, also shorted or I got a leak inside the transformer 
that is also a, a way to uh, to flip the HPFI. So, um, well, well, I need to go and get my isolation transformer before I can continue. And then I need to set up some voltmeters to monitor exactly what is going on. Then I will be able to figure out this leak. Oh, you got to see this. I actually had the idea. It was the input capacitors here, but I also had a leak in the high voltage. And this is, of course, a problem when you have more than one you know error at the same time but today i actually got two errors at the same time i'm now running on my super isolated fully balanced output uh, mains isolation right so here is 220 volts completely balanced and uh, here is the 220 input and this unit is of course off so let's look at the voltmeter here let's see if i can do this without short circuiting anything because if i if i short circuit here um i will of course take the fuses but i will not take the hpfi anymore right so i am in ac volts see let's measure one of them oh i got full input voltage and on the other one i got nothing so there's a leak this one is leaking to chassis no big surprise my hpfi is <laughs> tripping so that's actually going to be a full stop ahead here because the only thing there is on the power here is actually a power switch and the the mains transformer so there is a leak inside the transformer but it's also looking a little bit brown and old and uh, rusty so this rust uh, obviously went inside the transformer and uh, yeah this is just the end of this story just super sad i was expecting to have a lot of fun changing the different capacitors and the high voltage and um, i've got uh, i'm i'm totally sure that i found the right capacitor and all that but uh, i can't do this uh, with a leaky uh, mains to chassis it's it's not any fun because i can't of course i can power it using my isolation transformer right now but this is unit is definitely not safe to play with anymore due to the transformer sucks but okay so let me uh, play with the other things then maybe i don't give up that easy so down here was my c130 and of course this one is ground and of course the casing is also chassis so if there's a leak to chassis here what will then happen is that the 1300 volts uh, we got uh, for the cathode supply will go on chassis and then the transformer will now leak to chassis because now the chassis is 1300 volts right and then we'll have a problem but there's also i also found c117 so that is a double capacitor and that is cathode and that is the intensity and that is the focus and that capacitor is only rated 1000 volt and we only got a few hundred volts between those three points so so far that is okay but what is its voltage rating towards chassis and the three points if that is also 1000 we have a problem because then we are actually overdriving it um, over its capabilities and what have we got here have we got some leaky leaky things i don't know if i can show you this but it looks like i got some stuff between those two here right oh let me get some yeah there is some leaky thingy that is weird that looks like metal dust that can't be good what is that in the air 
Funny, funny, huh? Yeah, so there's still a little bit stuff to play with here. We are maybe not done today. So now this, that capacitor is nice and clean. It was actually maybe oil leak around those uh, three points. And that, what you see here, is not ceramic. That's actually rubber. And it's nice and soft. But it was super wet and sticky, juicy. Uh, can't be good. And another thing I just realized. Look at those wires. They go to those test points here on the back. And look at that. Very, very easy access. Just poke in your fingers here and get super fried. I mean, this is how you make french fries. Don't touch here. <laughs> That's minus 1200 volts or something like that here. I've been playing a little bit around with this leak. And I'm still on the isolation. And look at that. 600 volts to the chassis of C117, exactly as I thought. So here is definitely a problem. So that is nasty. By the way, hear this sound. I really don't like that as well. And now this capacitor here is completely gone. That pot meter still gets burning, burning hot. So, ugh, man, I am not happy. So how the heck is that possible? Oh, now it is a new day and I spend a million hours trying to track down all the leaky components. And yeah, it is more or less all the parts that I find capacitors all over the place. See, they are nicely metal encapsulated here and the chassis of the capacitor is mounted to chassis here but most of the capacitors i've been measuring they leaked uh, quite a lot when the voltage is uh, quite high on some of them so i mean and the transformer is also leaky and i got some really nasty problems all over this place so I think uh, I'm just gonna pack it back together and uh, call it a fun experience playing with it. But so far I really wanted to show you some of the really really cool and interesting tubes. This one here is called a, a Turatron. <laughs> I don't know exactly if I say that right. A Turatron is, uh, this is uh, called uh, an 884. And it is built a lot like a triode, as you know, a cathode, a, a grid, and a plate. So it is more or less just like a normal radio tube. However, this one contains a special gas. Instead of a super hot vacuum, the gas makes this um, very reactive. So if we look at a, a triode versus a tertron, we'll see the curve for a, um, a triode is nice and smooth and linear. So it can be used for analog amplification. While a tertron is uh, super reactive when the voltage uh, is below the trigger point or the activation point, it stays off. But when the voltage goes to a very special point it goes very reactive very fast and this is of course why it is very useful for sawtooth generators and that is exactly what it is used for in this product it is of course creating this sawtooth for the sweep and that sweep voltage is of course controlling the crt so we will draw this uh, the sweep, but it's also that voltage is also controlling our main oscillator tube, and that is right here. So in this socket here, we got our local oscillator, and that one is oscillating between eight and nine gigahertz. 
is called a 2K25, I believe. So it's called a Clustron. And that tube here is very, very special. So we got only four pins here, and then the output. And we also got the plate, or in this one it's called the collector, uh, for the electron beam to be collected, because it's not working like a normal tube where you're supposed to uh, have a plate that way. But the fun thing is, when you change the voltage on its collector, you also change the the size of the beam more or less here where it is resonating and therefore you change the frequency and this is exactly what they take advantage of in this um, spectrum analyzer they take this sweep uh, sawtooth uh, voltage and put on the plate or the collector here and there therefore um, the frequency changes uh, together with the sweep so the output here is actually a tiny little quarter wave antenna and that uh, antenna goes into the, the waveguide. So you can see there's a hole down here in the socket, right? It's a very special socket, specially made for this tube. So that one goes here, right? And here is the adjustments for the, the course frequency uh, alignment of this of the local oscillator and it's done by this screw here that is normally co cobbled to this that goes to the knob on the front right and when you tighten or loosen this screw you actually change the length of this piece here see there's also a mechanical adjustment in the other end here and this will actually bend the entire tube up and down in its resonant system because it's made of thin thin metal here and it is made to be bent isn't that fascinating so while we're looking here at the top what we see here is actually the resonant chamber that is connected to the waveguide the waveguide is underneath here you can see it a little bit. You can see a hole here. That is actually for the mixer diode. And this is how this works. So the output from the local oscillator, this little antenna, goes in here. There's a little fixed attenuator. I'll put in a, um, a block diagram or some other pictures here so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. And uh, so this uh, attenuator here gives a little bit of isolation between the resonant chamber and the oscillator and also the incoming signals and the detector and uh, so, the, so the, the chamber here actually changes sizes there is a, a piston sort of a piston system in here and this is coupled via gears to the adjustments you make here on the front and then you make this room bigger or smaller and uh, thereby uh, adjusting the local oscillator frequency the injection frequency to the mixer diode uh, they also call this a crystal detector but it is of course a diode and then you have you can see this uh, waveguide that goes to the input right here so now it's flipped around and now you can see exactly what i'm talking about here was here's the socket for the oscillator and here is the fixed attenuator and in here is the resonant chamber the diode here's the connector for the diode and this diode gives the IF frequency out and as you can see here there isn't any pre-selector or any other filters so that means the incoming RF here goes through an attenuator what, what this is actually made how this is made yeah Look at that screw here and here, and here and here. So we've got two bent uh, pieces of metal that's flexible. And here is a screw that goes through those two pieces of metal. And when you operate the attenuator, you just screw those closer 
or further apart. This way you open or close the input, just like the valve to your <laughs> radiator, <laughs> something like that, right? So incoming signal here, there isn't any pre-selector. So this means there is no mirror rejection. So this spectrum analyzer will receive just as good the positive and the negative result over and under the oscillator frequency. Okay, so the since this um, the IF, so here is a, an IF transformer that goes to the IF amplifier and oscillator and the and further mixing down tubes right here. And this IF here is 22.5 megahertz. So that means the mirror frequency and the wanted frequency, they will be 45 megahertz apart. So that is the distance to your mirror. And this is explained loud and clear in the manual. And this is just what you need to know how this works. And as long as you know this, uh, there's uh, not a big deal about it. All you have to do is tune the frequency up and down, find the first, find the next. Oh, now you know where you are. So that is not a big deal. This is just how it was in 1950 or something, right? They also explain in the manual about the local oscillator leak, because of course this signal goes straight through the, the pickup diode here, the mixer, mixer diode, and it also goes out. And uh, you can adjust this attenuator to use this uh, unit as a signal generator as well because this output here is actually one to two milliwatts uh, of leftovers after this uh, attenuator here. So let's look a little bit of, at this uh, super nice diode here. I took it out of the socket and this uh, socket here is actually placed like this. So this pin goes into that connector. And then we got some screws and stuff. Let me show you on the other side. So that goes on the other side and then you unscrew this one and then you mount this other piece of the diode into that. So that is uh, sitting here in the middle and it is called 1N23C. It's a little isolating disc here. Really, really cool diode. And that um, diode is a uh, 200 millivolt um, diode. It's made for detection, mixing, all sorts of uh, Doppler, triplers, whatever you want to use it for, really, in the um, S to X band. And so that means from 2 to 12 gigahertz. So this is a very nice item to use for all sorts of signal generators, detectors, mixers and stuff, whatever you like to uh, use it for. So I will pack this down for further storage. So thank you very much for watching. I hope you had f a little bit of fun. See you around. Bye-bye.